Welcome everyone. Um, how you doing today? I'm so proud that you resisted that sunshine, those beautiful blue skies to come and be with us here today. Uh, I am very excited about this program. I'm Barbara Ransby. I teach here at UIC and I direct something called the Social Justice Initiative. So I want to tell you a little bit about the Social Justice Initiative and then get right to introducing uh, today's program. So SJI is a 12-year-old project at UIC. We create space for activists, artists, and scholars to come together to collaborate, to conspire, to think of ways of achieving greater social justice. We believe in praxis, which is a unity of theory and practice. Uh, and recently, we have had speakers ranging from the late Albert Woodfox to um, Naomi Klein, Angela Davis, uh, many others, Mariam Kaba, who I know many of you uh, know. And for uh, two years, we have had something called the Portal Project, which has involved 200 people in conversations about abolition, about Christ, uh, the climate crisis, and about economic democracy. So we very much try to also acknowledge and uplift the fact that there are reservoirs of knowledge beyond the university. So even though we're housed at the university, we try to decenter the university uh, in terms of knowledge production uplifting the knowledge and wisdom of our grandparents, aunts, uncles, neighbors, uh, and friends. We do workshops, conferences, exhibitions, um, and we're very excited about a 2024 conference we'll be having called Freedom Dreams, Freedom Now. That'll be in September of 2024. Today's program is entitled, in that spirit of Freedom Dreams, Freedom Dreams Chicago Futures, because we are inviting you to dream with us today to imagine the city that we want to live in, to imagine a city in which all of our people belong, to imagine a city in which all of our people feel free and safe, where all of our people have their fair share of the city's abundance. It is a new day in Chicago. We believe very much in the power of ideas and the power of imagination, the power of action. If we can generate ideas about the kind of future we want, if we can imagine that future, then surely we can develop action plans for achieving that future. Now, we are very honored to have with us today the new mayor of the city of Chicago, <laughs> Brother Brandon Johnson. And Brandon Johnson is not a typical Chicago mayor, let's just say. He is different. He is one who is grounded in struggle and grounded in grassroots organizing who knows what it's like to be outside the gates of power and inside the throes of poverty. So we are in a unique moment. As we stand here today, the goal of a more just city in what has been one of the most segregated, unequal cities in the world is a goal more real than it has ever been. But it will require work. And that work has to go on in many areas. It has to go on in the area of ideas and research and struggle. It has to go on in the ideas of protests, in the arena of protests, organizing, and community building. And it has to go on in City Hall and City Council. So let's get on with today's program. I want to thank the co-sponsors of today's program, the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy, Amanda Lewis and Ivan Arenas, the Grassroots Collaborative. I want to thank my hardworking uh, colleagues in SJI, Bettina Johnson, Roxana Espos, Rhoda Ray Gutierrez, Lila Pan, uh, Lillian Paniagua, Mia Silva, and Essence McDowell, who couldn't be with us today. Also, Stacy Sutton, who is a professor in uh, urban planning and is the director of applied research and strategic partnerships at SJI, and who is actually at the helm of an exciting new program in partnership with the city of Chicago called Building Community Wealth. So again, welcome to today's forum. We will have a three-way conversation with Mayor Brandon Johnson and two activists, uh, who I'll introduce in just a moment, followed by a panel discussion of activists and organizers talking about what is at stake in this political moment uh, in this city. And then we will conclude with some virtual remarks for the city of Chicago uh, from none other than Angela Y. Davis. So let me introduce the two activists who will be conversing with Mayor uh, Johnson, and then I'll also introduce Kennedy Bartley, Bartley, who will come to the stage right after that. Jung Yoon is the campaign director for the Grassroots Collaborative, a community labor coalition. 
one of our popular organizers, where she co-founded co the Illinois Green New Deal Coalition and the People's Unity Platform Coalition. Jung brings, builds bridges between movements to build a united front of power to win just transition for all black and brown families and expand the collective imagination of what's possible, moving from economy, economies of extraction to economies of care. Rich Wallace is founder and executive director of EAT, Equity and Transformation, a Chicago-based group that works with formerly incarcerated citizens. He is a community organizer and the former de deputy director of the Worker Center uh, for Racial Justice. His work focuses on organizing black workers to confront the impact of economic disparities in housing, education, uh, and employment. And Rich is also um, a formerly incarcerated Chicago native who is also the summit executive of men and women uh, in prison ministries. So without further ado, I'm gonna invite our activists to the, to the stand and they will introduce our new mayor who will be in conversation with them. Chicago, how y'all doing? Again, my name is Richard Wallace and I have the awesome opportunity of introducing to you all the educator, the organizer, and now mayor, Brandon Johnson. Welcome, thank you for joining us today. Um, Mr. Mayor, you have mentioned the concept of co-governance often on the campaign trail. And I believe that co-governance has the potential to heal and transform the relationship between people and our city by creating collaborative processes for governing. But it's never been done before in the US. And so can you share with us what co-governing means to you and what are some um, principles and values that you will use to ensure that co-governing is successful? Well, good afternoon, thank you. I see we're not wasting any time today. I, I mean, I, no one asked me how my day was, brother. What did you eat? Your favorite color, something. Um, this is a real organizing meeting. Yep. You, <laughs> You also know you're in an organizing meeting because we don't feed each other. It's just like pretzels and water and like hummus. Can we get some non-vegetarians for once who can organize a meeting? What do you no, got I'm against teasing. vegetarians? I'm, no, no. Everybody knows I'm 60% plant-based. So that's what makes me, I don't know, fitting in this suit today. <laughs> um, you know, but, but you know, you're absolutely right. Like, Co-governance is essential to, to transformation in this moment. Absent co-governance, we're not going to have the type of city um, that the people of Chicago deserve. And so for me, um, I've said this repeatedly, it's essentially bringing the fifth floor and the community closer to one another. The space in between policy and those impacted by policy um, has been, um, it's, it's been polar to say the least. And so co-governance means participating um, in every aspect of governance that ultimately leads, ultimately, that ultimately leads to transformation. So that's working with um, my policy director in the policy department um, to help ensure that we're moving policies that impact what people really want to see on the ground. But that's also intergovernmental affairs as well because you know, policy actually has to be lobbied. And all of us have had traumatic experiences, truthfully, of having to convince someone who represents poor people to do something right on behalf of poor people. Um, and so it's policy, it's intergovernmental affairs. And look, the office of the mayor has long had a community engagement um, office. Um, under my administration, um, we're gonna have a real organizing model um, that presents opportunities for the type of engagement that's needed in order to move the city. Quite frankly, our policies um, um, are, are so revolutionary. It's going to take all of us in the various communities in which we live in to help whip the votes, ultimately, for those who represent the various wards to do right by the agenda that we've set. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can give it a little hand for the. Later. 
And can I just say, I know we don't have a lot of time, you all smell so good, too. Can y'all smell like this incense in the air? And, you know, it's that real black love oil. Like, that black consciousness smell is just amazing, isn't it? Brother G2 wearing it, too. You can smell it. Y'all give it up for Brother G2. Come on, show your love for G2. G2. All right, so we, we, like you said, we're going to ask the hard questions, right? Um, and so for me, I think about equity as being two or more groups being on relatively equal footing. Um, as we know, uh, the racial wealth gap and the wealth gap is continuing to grow both nationally and locally. Um, and so the question I have for you is um, ultimately, how is your administration preparing to uh, ensure that the wealthiest among us share the resources with those in need? So for every one dollar a white family earns in the city of Chicago, a brown family earns eight cents. For every one dollar a white family earns in the city of Chicago, a black family earns one cent. Wow. So when, when the corporate interest um, that moves their agenda through like publications like the Chicago Tribune, not that I read it, um, but when they, when they move their agenda saying that making sure that we are providing resources and support um, for those who have been struggling under the weight of poverty and disinvestment, and they, they, they attack my administration within 24 hours, that somehow changing the course of what, have, of what has caused, caused tremendous isolation and poverty as bad for business, it just reinforces why it's important that we make sure that we have the revenue streams that are needed yes, to ensure that communities that have been isolated intentionally by the politics of old. And so that's why I'm very much committed to the Bring Chicago Home organizing effort because a dedicated revenue stream, that's what's gonna ultimately eliminate the wealth gap that exists in the city of Chicago. And if any publication or anyone believes that disrupting the wealth gap is a bad idea for business, they should stop writing. <laughs> they should. Because there's nothing about making sure that every single family in the city of Chicago has the ability to live comfortably. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong about that and we're not going to allow anyone to make us believe otherwise. These individuals and the interests of those who have had a very isolated, narrow approach towards governance have been in charge for a very long time and they have failed us over and over and over again. It is well past time that we actually implement our ideas for economic equity and justice so that the good ideas that elected me can actually prevail. Thank you um, for bringing up the Bring Chicago Home campaign. Uh, it's a really important campaign to end homelessness in this city. Um, and you know, brought to you by grassroots organizers. And you were a community and labor organizer for years. So I'm curious if you could please share with us how that shapes how you're gonna enter this role of mayor. And what are some ways you anticipate that needing to shift to work within City Hall? And how are you going to handle when you inevitably become the target of protest? Okay, now hold on. <laughs> I mean, sister girl was like, yep, yep. <laughs> and she was like, we know where you live. <laughs> you know, let's just start with that part. Look, organizing to make sure that government does its part, I pray that that doesn't end because we're on the fifth floor. In fact, there is motivation to do more. But here, here's how I believe we can handle it. 
collectively. Now, I don't want to put on my organizing hat and remove the mayor's hat because it fits so nicely, by the way. <laughs> um, we get to organize the entire city. Look, you know how many votes we need uh, to pass legislation in Springfield and in city council. And the difference, though, will be you'll have someone on the fifth floor who is standing shoulder to shoulder with you. Now, look, there are going to be pressure points from every single direction. Make no mistake about it. And there are individuals, as I've said, who have not normally aligned with our politics and our values. I've made it very clear that there's room at the table for everyone. I'm not going to govern like the previous mayors and shut people out because we have a different ideological frame. And here's why that's important. If we can organize a city, you all, think about what we just did collectively together. You mean to tell me that we cannot organize the city that voted for our values? That we cannot organize the same city council, the same interests to actually allow us to govern our values? It doesn't stop here. We actually get better at it because we've already demonstrated that we know how to do it and we can win. That's the encouraging part. Now, as far as the three other parts to your question, <laughs> th there were a couple of executive orders that, that I signed right away, day one. Um, and one specifically around protecting workers in the city of Chicago. You know, the fact of the matter is that the labor movement has been crushed and demoralized by interest of corporate powers. And where has it gotten us, right? Property taxes are sky high. The, the removal of black folks from the city of Chicago has been exacerbated over and over and over again. It's been proven that the politics of old have failed. And so that's why it was important for me to dedicate someone in the office specific to making sure that not just those who are unionized have protection and leadership but workers as a whole, whether you work in a warehouse or whether you are a gig worker, you deserve to show up to work every day and experience dignity. And when you finally finish up that job, you should have some retirement at the very end to meet you there. These are basic fundamental rights that are deeply tied to organizing and they don't go away. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's not gonna get any easier. At the end it gets a lot easier, but for right now. Um, so for decades, the city has chosen to invest in prisons, pollution in the south and west sides, and divest from education, affordable housing, mental health, climate resi resilience, and um, jobs that provide and create vibrant communities. Um, how does your administration plan to lead the way in investing in housing, education, mental health, and living wage employment opportunities? Yeah, the, the, the addiction that the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, quite frankly, the country has had on jails and incarceration um, has been proven to be another example of failure. It has been. So much so that that application has been hovering over and has been integrated within our public education system where the pipeline has been created. Suspensions, expulsions, disinvestment, all of this has led to this addiction towards incarceration in jails that have, again, proven to be a failure. And so this is why I've made it very clear. Um, another executive order that I signed on day one was to make sure that we have a real dedication within um, my budget department to find the resources to make sure that we are investing in youth employment. Yes, sir. That, that, that is key. The best thing that you can do, I believe, for the city of Chicago is to demonstrate how much we love, care, and value our young people. <laughs> the second thing is the city of Chicago has established a, a guaranteed income program. Okay. And Cook County government, we did the same thing when I was over there. Ours was much larger. <laughs> in fact, the largest in the entire world. Okay. Um, 
We're going to expand that un under my administration, and we're going to be very intentional about making sure that we are identifying those who are formerly incarcerated. We have to read. Clap it up for that, y'all. <laughs> Because lastly, we, we really have to, to, to reshape this conversation around those who are formerly incarcerated. Because as, as we know in this room, you know, many of those individuals who, who suffered trauma and disinvestment were then penalized for the manifestation of the trauma that was imposed on them. And so why do we continue to punish people for the trauma which the system has created? Listen, once a brother or sister serves their time, we cannot continue to keep them incarcerated by keeping them away from housing, education, jobs, access to mental health care. And so that's gonna require an effort from every single entity. That's the faith community, our business community, um, obviously government, we all have to do our part to ensure that this system that has criminalized poverty and the level of melanin that one possesses, that we get to disrupt that system, transform it in a way that makes sure that no one has to experience that level of trauma just simply because of the zip code they were born in. Thank you. Okay, here we go, this eight part yeah. question. <laughs> You know, I have to get it all in right now. <laughs> it's all good. You're doing great, by the way. Thank you. So are you. Um, <laughs> so you're not a typical politician, whatever that means. <laughs> and, uh, but regardless, all elected officials really struggle to deliver on the campaign promises they make. Right? You, you promise us the world, we get out there and elect you, and then what? Right, and so uh, a lot of times elected officials will then blame it on the need for negotiation, for compromise, um, or they may uh, get a little too cozy to wealthy business interests. Yeah. So, <laughs> I'm curious, what are the values and principles that are non-negotiable to you that will help you deliver on your vision? Yeah, that's a good question, thank you. <clears throat> so I'm not cozy with the wealthy. Uh, I'm still on the 5700 block of West Superior. Right. Don't for, don't. And, and I'm not moving. You know there are rumors out there that I'm going to be moving? You're getting the text messages right now. That's right. That's why she was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm not moving. And, you know, and I say that because, you know, quite frankly, and I'm gonna answer the question in a couple of ways. One, it, it, it has been deeply humbling for my wife and I to go through this experience based upon the experiences that people are having with our experience. And here's what I mean by that. To, to ride through the Austin neighborhood and to see young black boys stop when they see all the vehicles because they know their mayor lives around the corner from them. So I'm gonna try not to get too emotional. I'm gonna save my tears for when I have to pass my first budget. <laughs> but it is a remarkable testament to, um, to the deep organizing that we've done. And that's really my accountability mechanism. And it's not so much um, individuals looking at me and say, Brandon, you promised and you said. Accountability to me is, what do you need to make sure that we deliver on those promises? And I truth truthfully, I need you. I need all of you. I need you all to continue to work in your various capacities and serve with the same love and energy that you've always served in. In fact, no, do more, do more. Um, I don't believe there's anyone in this room that's gonna outwork me. That's what I personally believe. No one works harder than me. Now, you can try, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm saying that because when you ask this question about how do we make sure that we deliver, that the children at Brunson, the children at DePriest, the children at Michelle Clark, who greeted my wife and I with so much pride, that's who I see, and that's who I feel, 
in every single decision that I make. Now, look, we have systems that are, that are age old that we have to disrupt. And there will be some moments where the movement can only get us so far for that moment. But I don't want us to get, since it's Sunday, we never get weary in our well-doing. That we don't have to faint because we didn't get it today. Now, the fact that we are here, it doesn't mean that we get to just go home, take a nap, though I desperately need one. <laughs> but it does mean, though, that the work that we have done that has gotten us to this point, we get to double down on it. And the accountability is really about how we have one another, not how we point out where we might miss one another. I'll say it like this. I grew up in a house, you know, it was a bunch of us. My father did not know whose turn it was to do the dishes. He just knew that they had to get done. And if it was my turn, if my father walked in and they weren't done, whoever he saw first, that's who he was going to deal with. <laughs> that, and so accountability in my home was, look, Brandon, if you're having a bad day, it's still your turn to do the dishes. Can I run the water for you? You understand what I'm saying? Look, if I run the water, are you good? All right, you run the water, you wash the dishes, I'll dry them for you, I'll put them away. Whatever it takes for us to get it done, that's the uniqueness in this moment, and that's what we get to do. Okay. So fast forward to 2027, and then the 2031. When you look back, what would success look like? What changes do you hope to make that you will be most proud if you succeed? So the previous question, this is a good way just to tie it all in. Look, we don't negotiate our values. Now we can negotiate the details of our values, but our values are what they are, and I've said it very clear. I want to eliminate the structural deficit that, have, that has weighted this economy down. We can't keep relying upon property taxes to generate revenue, and we get to make up to $1 billion of new investments. And so when you ask, like, what does it look like in 2027, um, we made a real commitment to make sure that mental health care services and centers are actually available and that we actually have mental health centers that are open and that treatment not trauma is not just a hashtag, but it is actually a policy. That we also, in 2027, made real strides towards real environmental sustainability. And that finally, getting around in this city through public accommodations, particularly the public transportation system, that we have made real strides in making sure that public transportation is something that is not just for those who find it convenient, but that we actually make public transportation a real public accommodation for those who need it. And then in 2027, you know, my hope is that that there are others in this room that find your inspiration through this space. And that whether you are in the labor movement, whether you are you know, organizing warehouse workers, or whether you are organizing, fighting for, for economic justice, fighting to make sure that those who are formerly incarcerated are seen and valued, that you find your leadership in this space too. That it's just not about getting me reelected. It could be about getting someone else elected in this room as well. It could be about someone in this group taking over an organization and being a part of the next level of infrastructure to bring the type of transformation that we need. So don't let 2027 just be about me. Let it be about all of us. Well, you heard him. <laughs> we got a lot of work to do together. Yes. So thank you so much. But you're welcome to. Does my hair look grayer already up there? <laughs> it's the lighting. It's the lighting. It's the lighting. It's the lighting, man. It's they the did the you lighting. dirty in that photo. <laughs> Just saying, y'all. And is that the same suit? Good grief. <laughs> I got to help a brother out. Thank you all so much. Thank you.